John chapter 20, looking at verses 19 to 23 today as we think about this fifth installment on the idea, the challenge, hear the bells ringing. John 20, 19 to 23, if you found that in your Bibles, or if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you, but we really want you to get your own Bible. You can talk to us about that, and we'll see what we can do to make that happen. Stand with me, if you would, and follow along as I read this portion of God's Word. It says, after Jesus has risen, and he gives them what is John's equivalent of uh, the Great Commission. Listen to this. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer this Christmas Eve morning is that as we are Many people, even people who don't give a thought of Jesus the rest of the year, have wrapped attention to God sending Jesus. That we will recognize this babe of Bethlehem who's grown in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men and came in the fullness of time to die on the cross and then rise from the grave. That he, in like manner, sends all who say they trust in him. Thank you. Please be seated. We're looking at the Bell's acrostic. It's taken from a book entitled Surprise the World. Linda has some copies printed on the back table for any who would like to read it. I think it's also online, isn't it, Linda, to be able to download if you want to put it into a, to a digital format or read it on your computer. And, the, and this acrostic, we talked about this last year. The genesis, of Brother Norman and I came across this book. And we read it and we talked about it at lunch and I thought, I said, man, this guy has hit upon something that maybe has been missing from my preaching through the years. That, that these things that we're to do as disciples who are committed to follow Jesus by making disciples ourselves is that we have to cultivate habits. When you're saved, there's not a little a heavenly fairy that shows up and sprinkles some spiritual pixie dust on you and then everything changes you 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 now uh, know exactly what to do and and you you avoid the things you shouldn't do and well how do you know that preacher well the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament said at one point I've learned to be content in the struggles of life you had to learn it he also said, the things that I know I should be doing, I find myself not doing. The things I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. Who is going to deliver me from this, this, this remaining sin? He understood, but we need to understand that when we're saved, we're, we're delivered from the, from the condemnation of sin. We're delivered from the, from the dominion of sin, but we're not delivered from the condition of sin. That's why sanctification is as, is as important as justification. Justification says we have been pardoned for our sins and counted as righteous before God, not for anything we have done, but only for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that, his person and work, and that received by us by faith alone. That's justification. But sanctification says that, that not only ha have we been delivered from the condemnation of sin, it's, it's justification teaches we are, we are being delivered from this from this condition we're being delivered from the power and so we've got to know the scripture to do that we've got to have a relationship with the spirit to do that we've got to recognize that the changes that need to come in the life of everyone who confesses Jesus Christ no matter if they came out of a very religious background and were taught a lot of things very religious 
the Pharisees were taught a lot of religious stuff, or whether they've come out of a completely pagan background and, and that they're a blank slate. We've got to cultivate habits. If we're going to change the world, we've got to change ourselves. You say, well, I thought the Lord changed it. He certainly does. He changes us and he gives us the tools, the means to keep on being changed, that sanctifying process, growing in grace. And so this little book, Surprise the World, was just a, uh, it blessed me, it, it blew me away, it rebuked me, it challenged me. And the thesis is that if you're going to be like Jesus in a world that desperately needs to see people living like Jesus, then you've got to be committed to some things. And that's where this acrostic comes from. You, you've got to be committed to blessing others. You've got, to, you've got to get out of that American churchianity mentality that says, well, bless me. Bless me. What's in it for me? I'm not getting blessed. Find that in the scriptures. You know where that is? That's in the book of Second Opinions. If we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to be committed to blessing others. Realize that we've been blessed by God in order to be a blessing to others. And we, we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to bless people. It, do you realize, I hope you've recognized this. Do you realize how much of an opportunity you, it's all year long, but, but now in this season, how receptive people are to blessings? Just encounter, look, God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas. I haven't had one person say to me, don't talk to me that way, that offends me. Nobody said that to me. No, but well, I have a Merry Christmas yourself. I mean, before they know it, they bless me. I'm going to bless. I'm going to speak a word of encouragement. I'm going to speak a word of kindness. People apologize. They, it's, it's, it's bump and run in the stores and the parking lots. And, you, and so people, well, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. No, no, no worries. Don't worry. You don't need to be apologizing. No problem. You go right ahead. Bless. We're going to cultivate a habit. A habit. We're going to intentionally do this. So that the day comes, watch this, so that the day comes when we automatically do this. But you don't automatically do this initially. It has to be a habit. I'm going to, so the challenge is I'm going to bless three people each week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church. You have an opportunity today before you leave this place to bless Several people. If you really get, get excited about it and take a run for it, you can bless a lot of people before you get out of here today. And then when you get out of here, you're going to go somewhere. I don't, there's not a person here that's going to go crawl under a rock when you leave here. You're going to encounter people, family, friends, strangers. And you can bless them. Eat. We talked about this habit. So we already have the habit of eating. I don't think there's, well, maybe, but probably not a person here who looked up at the end of the day and said, nuts, I forgot to eat today. It may happen occasionally, but that's, it's, not, it's not regularly. We already eat. Let's take the opportunity to invite people into that. To share hospitality. Table of fellowship. One of the reasons Karen and I wanted to have an open house was just to, to bless and to share hospitality. Listen. This one doesn't involve you encountering any human being. It's purposely stopping from the busyness of life. And if, you, if you're in a store this week and you stop, you can get run over. But so, it, so you may want to draw aside to uh, a quiet place, silence and solitude, and just listen and say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, for running through life as if I know what you want for me. Help me to listen. Help me to listen. What is there in my life that I need to jettison that need to abandon what what is there that's not in my life that needs to be called it's a habit you see it's a habit to listen 
than to learn, to learn more of Christ. I have a notion that when we start listening more intensely to the Lord, we will be increasingly desirous to learn to be more like Jesus. And in fact, that's where the impressions and the compulsions will take us, to be more like Jesus. So today, the final habit that needs to be cultivated is to live sent. I hope you were paying attention when we read 1 John 4 together three times in that passage the father sent him who sent the father sent the son to be the savior of the world Christianity is a worldview of action yes you got to have a lot of thought but it's a worldview of action there's no such thing as an inactive thoughtful Christian it's initiated by the only true and living God, the creator of heaven and earth, it is filled with action. Action verbs like gave, sent, come, go. From start to finish, Christianity is God's idea. We don't get to monkey with it, to tweak it, to pare it down, to fit our agenda, or to make us feel more comfortable in our culture. And this is the only way that God has prescribed that a sinner can be made right with him by grace, through faith, alone, in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. When we understand God's word, will, and ways, we'll become convinced of some things. First of all, that God gave his only begotten son, John 3.16. That God sent Jesus that Jesus came, that Jesus went about doing good, keeping the whole law of God perfectly. Jesus would go to the cross to suffer and die in the place of all who would trust in him, bearing in his body our sin on the cross, enduring God's punishment for our sins, satisfying God's divine wrath and justice as he died in the place of sinners. Jesus would rise from the grave, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. Jesus would declare that he was sending all those who were his disciples into the world to describe the glorious story of God's love for sinners shown in his life, death, and resurrection. And at the same time, warning of the eternal hell that awaits all who will reject God's offer of mercy and grace. Isn't that interesting? God is love. God is love. God is love. We read that all through 1 John 4. Well, if God is love, no big deal. No, no, God is love. And he's shown his love by sending Jesus Christ. And you reject his overture of love, then you will face his wrath and eternal hell. That's not contradictory. God can be love, the essence of love, and show holy wrath at the same time and not be contradictory. It's the nature of his being. Alan Hirsch, who's an Australian missiologist, and I really should be wearing a scarf to read this, because if you know anything about Alan Hirsch, you know that... Uh, that if any video we watched of him in, in the Verge Network videos when we were doing the Disciple Making 101, he always had a scarf on. I put one on and I thought, I tell you, I'm no Alan Hirsch. I can't talk like him. He's Australian. I don't look like him. He's got a wavy hair. I got no hair. My hair waved bye-bye to me some time ago. So, with apologies to Alan Hirsch that I'm not wearing a scarf. Listen to this quote from him. Every Christian is a sent one. There is no such thing as an unsent Christian. You say, well, that's a, it's those stuffy Australians, what do they know? Charles Spurgeon, sometime before Alan Hirsch, said, Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Well, I, I think I prefer Alan Hirsch's comment. <laughs> the first time I read that, I thought, oh, that hurts. Well, what, what's a missionary? Well, the idea of the word missionary is from the Latin missio, which means sent. Apostle. There were 12 apostles. One betrayed Jesus, another took his place. 
There are people strutting around the earth today calling themselves apostle so-and-so and apostle so-and-so. It was, it was really a function more than a title. Because it's from the Greek, apostolos, which means, guess what? Sent. Can I get the impression that Jesus wanted to be sure we knew that if we claimed him as our Lord and Savior and were committed to his commission, as you go, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do, to practice all the things I've commanded you to practice. You get the impression that he wants us to live sin. Look at our text here. Just drop down basically to verse 21. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Does that remind you of anything? It reminds me of John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And as surely as I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you, will come again, receive unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, well, I don't know. I'm not sure about that, Lord. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Thomas. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he closes that passage, that precious 14th chapter. Peace I give you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Not the kind of peace the world gives. Not that kind of peace. It doesn't last. Peace the world gives is too quickly replaced by chaos, turmoil, struggle, strife, disappointment, heartache. Jesus said, I'm giving you a peace not like the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So he speaks that night. And I, I put myself there and I'm thinking, that's one of the last things they heard from him in that upper room discourse before he went to the cross. Peace be with you. And then he says to them, now note, he says this to a group of people locked upstairs in a room for fear of the Jews. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. He had told them earlier in his ministry, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. The odds are going to look terribly stacked against you. And you say, well, I'm sure glad it's not that way today. Talk to the folks in Indonesia. Talk to the folks in North Korea. In Iran. Iraq. Somalia. Sudan. Eritrea. We could go down the top ten list that we've just finished praying up through in recent weeks. It is still like that today. Sheep among wolves. And so when he told them this, he brought them together and he breathed on them. I, get this. When I read that, I think God scooped up some earth in the beginning and molded what something that looks like me and you except in a much superior form and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, a nefesh that would never die. Even when his body died, his soul would never die. And so he breathed on them. And when he breathed on them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they would. They would not many days later. The same group of folks cowering in the upper room with the doors locked. They didn't want the Jews to get to them. Looked up and Jesus had come through the locked door. <laughs> and not many days later, the Spirit would come upon them in power. And you know what? When you and I are saved, that same Spirit comes upon us in power. Brings us from death to life. From darkness to light. We're going to look tonight, if you're able to come back at five, post-tenebras 
Lux. If you follow the ministry of R.C. Sproul, you know that that was sort of his life challenge. Post tenebras lux. After darkness, light. When the light of the world sends the Holy Spirit into our lives to give us the new birth, we're brought from darkness to light. From death to life. The same Spirit. And so we need to cultivate this habit of living sent. Begin identifying ourselves as a missionary. A sent one. Let me just let me go through this real quickly with you this morning. Now, I don't know your movie habits. But if you're, if you're into movies or into certain movies, one of the things you like to watch is the trailer. The teaser. It's a burst. It's, it's not unoften. When Karen and I have gone to a theater and or maybe watching on TV and a movie trailer comes up that she has an interest in going to see. And when the trailer's finished, she looks at me and says, I don't even need to go see it now. They showed me wrong. If a trailer does its work, it captures your attention and interest and you want to see the real thing. That's what you and I are, folks. We are movie trailers. We are walking, talking, living movie trailers. And those watch us. We hope and pray that they see Jesus in us in such a way that they will say, I, I want to go see that movie. I want to go see that movie. Or really what we want them to say is, I want to see the world they come from. For conscientiously, intentionally living sent my friend, my mentor, R.F. Gates, used to try to drive this into our heads. He'd say, he called me Sir William. Sir William, when you go to get a haircut, you're not there primarily to get a haircut. It's just your need of a haircut that got you there by God's leadership. You're there to tell of Jesus. When you go to the store to get green beans, you're not there primarily for green beans. It's just you're, you're having run out of green beans and your need of them that God used to get you there. Living sent. We want to show people what the reign of God looks like. So that they have an interest. That they want to taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me go through some things real quickly with you this morning. Well, how do we do that? How do we live sent in the 21st century? Well, first of all, I would suggest that we, and I'm taking this right out of, out of the book, Surprise the World. This is not very creative. But I think he nailed the notion of living sin. And I would be silly to try to improve upon it. First of all, you, you promote reconciliation. I've told you first Sunday I preached to you. I've told you for 12 years since that reconciliation is the essence of the gospel. And when two professing believers cannot find a way to get along, they have functionally, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know their hearts, they've functionally denied the gospel. They've denied the fact that Jesus died on the cross, according to Paul in Ephesians 2, to tear down the middle wall of partition, separating the two, to make himself one new man of the two. That the same cross that we imagine, not imagine, it really does, makes us right with God, reconciles us to God, also reconciles Reconciled sinners to one another. Promote reconciliation. People are at odds. We need to be the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. Blessed are the peacemakers. See, if we're the strife stirrers and not the peacemakers, if we're the folks who have a bucket in our hand but the bucket's not water, it's gasoline and we're hiding a match, that's, that's not... Being, promoting reconciliation. Yet the gospel, the essence of the gospel is to repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. I would also suggest promote justice. 
You know, you have this term social justice warriors that's used today, and it's, it's, it's used a lot of times about, about folks who, who seem to want to, they, I think they're, I'm going to give them the credit, their motive is to do right, but in do, trying to do right, they're, they're savaging a lot of things and, and throwing a whole lot up in the air, and, that's, and because of that, a lot of professing Christians, a lot of Southern Baptists who otherwise would have a lot of common ground are kind of at odds with one another. And, but there is injustice in the world. Christianity has always recognized that. It was the Christians in the first century who when the Romans would, uh, you remember the, we read this back to you when we preached uh, on a pro-life issue years ago about a Roman uh, commander who wrote to his wife who was due to have a baby and he said, I hope you're fine. I guess the baby's been born by this now. Uh, if it's a boy, name him such and such. If it's a girl, kill it. And so they would, they would put these children on what they call abandoning walls. They would take them and lay them out on these abandoning walls where they would be exposed to the elements, these newborn babies, maybe be devoured by the animals, maybe just die from the elements. And the Christians would watch and slip out and get them and take them home and raise them. And it was against the law to do that. But multitudes of Roman babies were raised in Christian homes. Justice, the promotion of justice is, is not a novel idea with social justice warriors today. It's in the heart of Christianity. It's in the prophetic utterance, Micah, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to show mercy, to walk humbly before your God? Promote justice. It will eliminate sex trafficking. I mean, there's the challenges. Provide clean water. When we first went to Haiti, one of the first things we did was we took, because of your generosity, we took 50 Sawyer water filters to attach to five gallon buckets because they didn't have a well like God has helped us to install now. As long as I have a memory, I will never forget that little girl, two, three years old, who never had clean water. Clean water in Haiti primarily is accessible only in, in, a, in a bottle in a store. And those children will never see that. And I'll never forget when we put that Sawyer water filter in that bucket and they poured the water out of that, out of that well, which, which was nasty looking. And that water came out of that filter and she took it in a little cup. And the idea was, the principal, uh, Pastor Joseph, was going to let them fill a cup and then let them share. And this little girl took that cup and began to drink in her eyes. It's like, what am I drinking? And she turned it up and gulp, 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 gulp. I'll never forget that. Promote justice. Promote beauty. We sing a hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. It's one of these hymns about God's creation. He's made all things beautiful in his time. And, and Christians, it's easy to point out the ugly. There's so much ugly around us. And we don't need by our attitudes to contribute to it. But we need to promote beauty. The wonder of the mountains, the wonder of the canyons, the wonder of a, of a sunrise and a sunset. My, my neighbor collects sunsets. And he'll post them every now and then on his Facebook page. So I've, I've started sending him sunsets. And Oklahoma, by the way, has some of the most beautiful sunsets. Just to stop and consider the wonder. Music. You see, we need to contribute. Poetry. We need to contribute to the beauty that is the essence of our God and the essence of His creation. In anticipation of the day when all things are made new, when a new heaven and a new earth comes down. And we will see life as it was meant to be and, and was for a season in Eden. We of all people should promote it. It's an expression of God's rule. C.S. Lewis said this, For the beasts can appreciate beauty, and the angels are, I suppose, pure intelligences. They understand colors and tastes better than our greatest scientists, but have they retinas or palettes? 
Now fancy the beauties of nature are a secret God has shared with us alone. That may be one of the reasons why we were made was to behold the beauty of the Lord. Wholeness. Promote wholeness. People are so broken. If you're just paying attention, people are broken relationally. They're broken financially. They're broken physically. They're broken emotionally. And I was reminded of Luke 7.22 when John the Baptist was having a crisis, was in prison, his death was imminent, and he sent to Jesus and said, ask him, is he the one to come or should we expect another? They went back to John in Luke 22 and he answered, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Has it occurred to you that everything Jesus touched was restored? Whether it was pots of water made into wine for a wedding, whatever it was, what Jesus touched was restored. I tell you what, I've been to some funerals and I would love for him to have showed up walking through the street and met the procession. Because when he did that, the dead came out of the, of the casket. Jesus was about the matter of restoring. He has made all things new. And we should be about that. We should be engaged in the business of restoring marriages. Helping people get whole whose, whose lives have been ravaged by sin and sinners. Offer a better way to show that they're still lovable and lovely and we can love them. We need to do that. That's part of what we do to live as sent ones. And the book, Surprise the World, will close with just suggests you do this by journaling. And here's why. Who remembers what you ate three weeks ago this past Friday? Now if you do, talk to me after the service. I wanna, I wanna know what you're using to train that kind of memory. We forget. We forget. And so if we're gonna live sent, we need to become aware of those opportunities that God is giving us to encounter people and become aware of those opportunities we have missed. It's a habit to cultivate. And as we do that, some things are going to open up. We're going to be open up to, to the way God moves. Perhaps in recent days you've encountered something, experienced something, and you go, I don't understand that one bit. I, I'm sorry, I don't see where God is in this. But if we learn to journal, and we make that notation, and then days, maybe weeks later, connection may be made. Praying for people. You, you encounter people and you say, well, I need to pray for, for Bob. I, God, let me meet him today. And, and we may walk away with every intention. I'm going to pray for Bob. <laughs> and then we forget about Bob. Let's use this tool. And you can do these things. It helps you to process events. It helps you to make sense of God's work. It helps you to keep a record of, of insights He's teaching you from the Word and from the encounters. It teaches you to ask important questions. I tell anybody, if you have a Bible reading plan and you, you're, not, you're not where you think you ought to be understand the Scriptures, here's what you do. You start in the Gospel of John, you go to 1 John. But you open your Bible, you put a notebook and a pen or a pencil beside it, and as you're reading and you hit something like chapter 3, verse 19, you write, now, I'm not sure that I understand what's happening here. What are you doing there? You're journaling so that you better understand the Scriptures rather than to read through it, mark it off, and sit up and go, what did I just read? James warns against that. Handling the word in such a way that you're like you look into a mirror, walk away, and forget what you got on. Insights. Ask important questions. Then it, you learn to identify yourselves differently. I'm not going to ask you here today. You say, "Well, I'm just not really big into journaling." Do you have a fitness device? Your fitness device 
is a journaling. Tells you how many steps you took. At the end of the day, you look back and you go, wow, that was a good day. 10,000 steps recommended if you want to try to stay healthy. Or at the end of the day, you go, oh my goodness. I must have been a virtual couch potato today. Journaling tools. We do that already in some fashion. I would suggest we cultivate the habit to learn to journal about our life as a Christ follower in our desire to grow in awareness and practice of being a disciple. So this is what the author says, keeping a journal and recording all the ways you are mirroring God's work in the world is like a fitness tracker. It'll start to shape the way you think about yourself. You'll eventually come to self-identity as a missionary, as a sent one. I want to close with this, Galatians chapter 4. You know, we, we're here, we're in the incarnation season, and we, we read the historical record of it. Paul, I've told you before, when Paul writes about these things, he writes theologically about them. Listen to this in Galatians 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son. Watch this. God sent his son. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir. I want to ask you as we close, are you living with a keen awareness that Jesus was sent by God to save you from their, your sins? Are you living with a keen awareness that God and Jesus sent the Spirit to teach us and convince us that God wants to relate to us as a tender father, as daddy? That's, the, that's Abba. In Aramaic, Daddy. Are you living as a son? Or are you a slave to things because you've not taken advantage of the opportunity to cultivate disciple-making habits that are guaranteed to make you more like Jesus, make you a greater blessing, see the effect of your life and the lives of others? What's it going to be? Slaves or sons? Slaves or sons? If you're saved by grace through faith here today, you're a son or a daughter of the living God. He's given us the tools to be sure that we grow in likeness to Jesus Christ. We come to the end of 2017. My prayer for all of us. And as we celebrate this Christmas, filled with so many joys and thrills and the wonder of God becoming man in the person of a baby in the stable of Bethlehem. We will determine, once and for all, encouraging one another along the way, that we, by God's grace, and according to His will, His desire, we will become the change that we want to see in the world. We'll not be content to simply gripe about the world. We will intentionally become the change we want to see. I pray you have a wonderful remainder of the day. I pray you'll be able to come back with us tonight at night, but whoever comes back, we're going to have a great time, a candlelight service to show in, in very graphic pictorial expression that Jesus is the light of the world. That you have a Merry Christmas tomorrow. And as you give presents and unwrap presents, that you'll never forget that God gave the greatest gift. No one will ever match him. No one will ever match him. He gave the greatest gift. And we, while we live, must share this gift with all we encounter by his grace, for his glory. Let's pray.